Good morning, and thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedules to attend my presentation. Today, I'll be giving a presentation on some of our research that we've been conducting over the last couple of years on the spatial ecology of two mongoose species within KwaZulu-Natal. Today's presentation will be broken down into three sections, a brief background, some of the methodology we used in the study, as well as some results and some conclusions from this research. Spatial ecology of small carnivores are a special concern because they have often been overlooked for their larger flagship cousins. Additionally, if one integrates the fact that they are difficult to study because of their elusive nature, this can potentially provide explanation to why they have been generally excluded from research, particularly in Africa. So taking into fact that difficult to study, we need to gain insights and models on how mesocarnivores are affected by active land use change, such as farming and urbanization. In terms of the amount of research, minimal ecological research has been done on mesocarnivores and herpestidae as a whole in Africa. They persist the presence of human wildlife conflict, particularly in agricultural areas, as they are regarded as vermin and able to transmit rabies. Additionally, there is a grain market of muti trade for their parts. In terms of the table provided here, we can see that there is quite a limited amount of research conducted on the two target species of this study in terms of their overall home range behaviour and we can see a handful of publications that have been provided. Hopefully this study will be able to give more insights into how processes of agriculture and urbanisation are affecting their land use. So gaining insight into home range and habitat selection can give us overall insight into their overall behaviour as well as their movement ecology, and this is important for their overall conservation. One of the greatest threats to biodiversity globally is anthropogenic land use change through the process of urbanization and agriculture. These anthropogenic forces fragment habitats and often result in destruction of habitats available to biodiversity. Simple structures such as fencing and buildings often disrupt movement paths of animals. Additionally, humans, and particularly urban areas, have been known to supplementary feed wild animals, and this has resulted in a whole range of issues such as malnutrition, altering individuals' diet, and overall resulting in behavioral changes, and this ultimately leads to further human wildlife conflicts. The aim of our study was to determine the home range and habitat use of water and large grain mongoose within the KwaZulu Natal along a land use gradient. We hope that this would enable us to fill the knowledge gaps that are present in terms of interactions, if any are present, as well as movement and activity. Because of the time constraints of this presentation, I'll only be presenting results of the home range. We also hope to provide information to better conserve these species and to mitigate future human wildlife conflicts between mongooses and humans. Our first target species is a solitary nocturnal mesocarnivore, the water mongoose. It has a generalist diet consisting of aquatic prey and has a large distribution that stretches from southern Africa all the way up into central and eastern and western Africa as depicted by the figure at the top. The individual is noted to be dependent on a riparian habitat. Our second target species was the solitary diurnal large grey mongoose. These individuals have a generous terrestrial diet and are slightly smaller than our water mongoose. They have a wide distribution within Africa, stretching from South Africa and are found in northern parts of Africa. They are noted to be dependent on the grassland and dense bush habitats. Now we will be moving on to the methodology we utilised during this study. Trapping sites were located within the farmland natural mosaic of the Kaysnay Midlands, namely Mbona, Tilitalim and Dalkru, and Kloof represented our urban mosaic site. These sites were suitable as they had large enough populations of water mongoose and large grey. We used walk-in traps for the study. These traps were camouflaged with vegetation from the surrounding area and baited with chicken hearts and chicken intestines. A camera trap was located at the front of the trap to capture any other carnivore species that were interested in our bait. The traps were checked three times a day, first thing in the morning, in the mid-afternoon, and in the evening. 
A veterinarian was always on call to assist with this project. Once an individual was trapped, it was swiftly shifted into a containment trap where it was later sedated by a vet using a combination of Anakit and Domitor. Once the individual was suitably sedated, we took a number of important morphometric measurements, as well as bloods and anal and oral swabs for future analysis. And if the individual weighed a suitable mass, we attached a GPS UHF collar. The collars were programmed to record activity every hour, as well as ambient temperature, and to gather four GPS points per day during the species activity times. All information was sent remotely to a base station that allowed us to gather these GPS points off-site. In terms of home range analysis, the GPS points were first filtered on R and then a home range analysis was conducted in RHR which is agreed freely available on R. Site fidelity was first tested before any home range analysis was conducted to indicate whether the individual actually has a home range. Two home range measures were utilized in the study namely the minimum convex polygon and the fixed kernel density at both the core or 50% area and a 95% confidence or the home range and we use the reference bandwidth for the fixed kernel density. Now I'll be moving on to our results and conclusions of this study. In our study we managed to successfully collar 25 mongooses. This consisted of 19 water mongoose and 6 large grey. In terms of the tracking duration, we started tracking mongooses in August 2016 and finished the study in January 2019. This value is the cumulative tracking period for all individuals and is not individual specific. On average, collared mongooses gave us 270 GPS fixes each, which is, represents the largest data set for these species globally. Importantly, all individuals seemed unaffected by the GPS device and remained in the individual territories that they were trapped in. In the picture we can see three study sites within the farmland areas, consisting of water mongoose and large grey spatial movements. Let's zoom into site B and take a look at the various individual movement patterns of these collared mongooses. Depicted in the pink is a large male water mongoose which has a fairly large range which surrounds three individual large grey mongooses represented by purple, green and yellow. Swiftly moving on to the urban site, we can already see the amount of residential buildings in these areas. All the GPS tags in these areas represent water mongoose other than the pink tag encircled by the yellow. This is the only large grey mongoose that we managed to collar in this study site. Zooming in to the Nkonka Valley, we can see the movement patterns of four mortar mongoose. The yellow depicts a male as well as the green tag, and we can see their home ranges never overlap. However, these individuals' home ranges overlap in some ways significantly with the two females, mortar mongoose, that are represented by the pink and the blue tag. Moving on to our home range core utilization by mortar mongoose, we can see already a large significant difference between the core area utilization between farmland water mongoose and urban water mongoose. The same trend was present for the 95% home range, with a significant difference between the individuals found in farmland areas as opposed to urban areas, and we can see this large home range size difference between these individuals. The same trend was present within the large grey core area. We can see this large home range size or core area size for the farmland individuals as opposed to the urban sites and this was once again mirrored within the 95% home range size at both the MCP and the KDE level. So drawing back to the table I showed you in the introduction we can see that our study has highlighted the vast difference in the home range size for both the large grey and the water mongoose and this has been vastly estimated from previous literature. Additionally, in terms of the urban sites, we can see a vast reduction in terms of the home range size for both species. To give a bit of perspective, the figure here shows the mean home range sizes for farmland water mongoose and urban water mongoose. And we can see just the sheer scale difference between the movement patterns of these individuals. The home range for both the large grain water mongoose was much larger than previous information has indicated. 
highlighting the significant underestimation of these individuals' home range requirements. There also persists individual variations within the species, which is a growing body of evidence within ecology. Urban water mongoose also had much smaller home ranges than their farmland counterparts, which highlights the species' ability to adapt to the environment around them and to make the most of these fragmented patches within the urban study sites. So species' home ranges differ in size potentially due to prey availability and suitable habitats, as well as processes of habitat fragmentation and modification affecting their spatial movements. Anthropogenic pressures, such as vehicle collision and domestic pet interactions, seem to be an ongoing threat for these species. In the picture, we can see a large grey that had a collision with a vehicle and a water mongoose that came off worse with an interaction with a domestic pet. Finally, I'd like to give a special thanks to the various sponsors that allowed this project to take place. Special mention to the veterinarians that took time to assist me and also to the Conservation Symposium for allowing me to give this presentation. Thank you for your time. I look forward to any questions.